Well, you can join me in opening your Bibles to the book of Leviticus. You all came back. (laughs) Maybe some of you didn't know. (laughs) Kidding. Um, And if you would, so Leviticus, third book in the Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can grab one under a seat nearby. Um, And turn uh, to page 105 in those Bibles. This is Leviticus 26. And verse 11, we'll read this together. It's the heart of why this book exists, and then we'll pray. I will make my dwelling among you, God says, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word and all of it, including every word in the book of Leviticus. And so we believe that your word is living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword, piercing to the core of who we are, and we believe that's true of the book of Leviticus as well. So we pray that you would prove that to be true in these coming weeks. Use our time together studying the book of Leviticus to speak to us, to inform our minds, fill our minds with truth about your goodness and beauty and this world you've made. Fill our hearts with affection and transform our character to become more like Jesus. Amen. Okay, so welcome to Leviticus. This is most Christians' least favorite book of the Bible. It's the place where maybe some of your Bible reading plans before have gone to die. But I hope that through this series, this book will become, for some of you, one of your favorite books in the Bible. So we're calling this series restoring the life we lost in Eden. And so I want to show you in this series that that is what this book is actually all about. Eden was the world that you and I were made for in the beginning. It's a world of communal joy and purpose and flourishing with God. But humanity rejected God and we've lost it. And the story of the Bible unfolds God's plan to give it back and even better through Jesus. So this is what Leviticus is all about. It's about restoring the life that we lost in Eden. Now, there are a lot of reasons why Leviticus is hard to appreciate at first. Some of you no doubt have read it many times, and I'm reading the Bible through a year plan or on your own. Some of you have skipped it or you stopped reading it over time. Some of you have never read it, Um, and you didn't even know that it has a reputation for not being read or appreciated. But there are a lot of reasons that make it hard to appreciate at first. It's ancient literature. It feels very culturally removed from us. It's strange to us. It deals with blood and sacrifice and strange commands. Israel could eat some animals, but not others. And it has to do with details of how an animal's hoof is parted or whether or not this swimming creature has scales. What's going on there? Much of it is left unexplained. We learn about sacrifices and the process for offering them, but we don't hear why. We learn about why certain animals were viewed as unclean or clean, and it doesn't have to do with hygiene, but but something else. Like, well, what is that? Why, Why clean and unclean language? And why this animal, not that animal? What's going on? We often have to go to other books in the Bible to understand what's going on here. The book's also hard because We're not bound to practice these rituals and laws. It was for Israel in their covenant, but Jesus has come, and so we have a different relationship to all of this. So those are a few reasons why it's hard. So why are we doing this series? Well, first, we believe 2 Timothy 2.3, which says that all Scripture is breathed out by God, and it's profitable for us. And it makes us wise for salvation in 
Jesus. And so when we choose a sermon series, one principle is to move around the Bible, Old and New Testament and around all the genres, wisdom and gospels and letters, historical books. And so it's time for a book like this. Second, Leviticus reveals the heart of God. At the heart of this book is a vision of a holy God who wants sinners like us with Him. The goal of the tabernacle and the sacrificial system is experiencing life with God, which is why we read those couple verses to start here. Third reason why we're doing this is because Leviticus reveals Jesus. Every part of Leviticus is carefully planned by God to prepare humanity for Jesus, and not in the way that I've heard it sometimes, like as if the stuff Leviticus talks about is really just kind of arbitrarily burdensome, and kind of the point was just to make it so complex and annoyingly difficult that when Jesus come, we'd finally just sigh and say, oh, good, now it's so easy, right? That's not the point. It's to prepare us for Jesus because it tells us who He is and and facets of His glory. The priests, the sacrifices, the tabernacle, the drama of the rituals, all of these teach us and point forward to Jesus, and not in a way that we Christians kind of arbitrarily read things back into it, but this was their intent all along. Fourth reason, it taps into the deepest reasons for our existence. Some, uh, actually everyone in our culture, it seems, is longing, rightly, for meaning and purpose. We're in a crisis of meaning and purpose today. And this book speaks to it. So we're not like closing our minds to our cultural moment here and just studying some ancient archaic book that doesn't relate. Leviticus speaks to us in our cultural crisis and in the the questions we all have as humans. We were made to enjoy God's presence and reflect His character in all of life. That's our purpose, relevant to every moment in every corner of our lives. And that's what Leviticus is about. Finally, it answers the most pressing question for humanity, whether or not we know it, how can sinners survive the presence of a holy God? And not just survive it, but actually enjoy it. Leviticus answers this question and points to how Jesus is the ultimate answer. So this morning is an introduction to Leviticus. I want to show you that this is about restoring the life that we lost in Eden, and this will help us see that it's relevant for our lives today. So here's what we'll do. First, in order to understand Leviticus, we have to understand the tabernacle. We have to see that the tabernacle, this tent that God placed in the middle of Israel's life, is a symbolic Eden. That's the first point. And then from there, we'll see three central themes in Leviticus that flow from this. So all three have to be understood in relation to the tabernacle as a symbolic Eden. So here's the three themes, entering God's presence, reflecting God's character, and receiving God's sacrifice. So that's where we're headed. So first, longest point this morning, the tabernacle is a symbolic Eden. So the book of Leviticus has to do with how God has come to dwell with Israel. He caused His presence to dwell with them in a large portable tent called the tabernacle. And a whole system of rituals and sacrifices and a way of living is set up in relation to God's tabernacle presence. And so here's what I want us to see. It was all set up to symbolically dramatize the restoration of the life we lost in Eden. In order to understand this, we have to see that the tabernacle was a symbolic Eden. I think if we miss this, we're just going to miss so much of what Leviticus is all about, and it's the reason why we'll neglect it and be bored with it, and we won't see its relevance to us. So the first thing that helps us see this is by noticing that Leviticus is part of a big story. It's part of the first five books of the Bible, which we call the Pentateuch or the Torah. 
And those five books, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, they tell a story. And Leviticus is part of that story. It's continuing a narrative from Genesis and Exodus. In fact, for those of you who have Hebrew Bibles open in front of you, you see the first word. I'm kidding, but maybe one or two. I think that'd be great. The first word in Hebrew in Leviticus is and. It's continuing where Exodus left off. So it's continuing a story. And the beginning of the story is in Genesis. It's the story of Eden. So if you want to understand Leviticus, you have to understand the opening chapters of Genesis and how that story leads right up to the and that begins Leviticus. So Genesis 1 and 2 give us the beautiful beginning of the story of the Bible. You can flip there. It's not hard to find. First page is there. Uh, I won't be reading parts of it, but just you can scan it as I talk and just see what's going on here. So it portrays God as creating the world over the course of seven days in Genesis 1 and into chapter 2. At the center of this world is a place called Eden. Eden is situated on a mountain. We don't often talk about that, but that's clearly what's going on. There's rivers flowing from it, so it's called the mountain of God later in the Bible. So you have a mountain And Eden is on there, and there's a garden in Eden up there. Not like a backyard garden, though. More like a beautiful, lush, natural, or a national park. And God placed Adam and Eve as the first humans in that garden. So here's the picture. The surrounding world is a wilderness, not fully tamed yet. And then up the mountain is Eden. And in Eden is the garden. So Eden's not the garden. It's like the garden of Eden. It's the garden in Eden. It's a helpful way to think about it. And God comes to walk with them in this sacred space. He has fellowship and friendship with humanity. He also gives them every tree for food. So he's inviting humanity to have joyful feasts in his presence. He gives them the tree of life. They eat it. They'll live forever. There's also another tree, knowledge of good and evil. If they eat it, it's disobeying God and they'll die. And God himself is portrayed in these opening chapters as a king over his realm. And humanity is created in his image and placed in this kingdom as royalty, kings and queens to rule and reflect God's character in the world, to spread communities of joy and peace and love and harmony So that's Genesis 1 and 2, and then it all falls apart in Genesis 3. Satan took the form of a serpent and deceived Adam and Eve. They rejected God's command, so they reject him as king, and then they hide from his presence rather than enjoying his presence, and God sentenced them to death, which has all sorts of ramifications, right? Spiritual death, physical death. They were exiled from Eden, so kicked out of Eden, sent away toward the east. And the way back to Eden was guarded. So if they wanted to go back into Eden, it's guarded by cherubim, these winged angelic guardian creatures, and a flaming sword, which was a clear signal. You try to get in here, you die. The way is shut. So the message is clear. You are now in the realm of death. Your life is lived east of Eden. The Edenic world of perfect joy and peace and harmony is gone. Life is hard, then you die. And that's where we're born. And that's where humanity has lived ever since. This is our story. But God sent them out with a promise. He promised that one would come from the line of Eve to crush the head of Satan. And this promise develops in the Bible, and we see over time that it's a signal that God is going to reverse this curse. And one day, through the work of this Savior, whom we know as the Lord Jesus Christ, this warrior king, he will restore the lost life of Eden. But for now, humanity is locked out. And so the question in the Bible and over all human history is, how will God bring us back into his presence and the lost blessings of Eden? And both of those are important. 
because we're creatures. So the question isn't just how do we go to heaven when we die, to God's presence. It's both God's presence and the lost creational blessings of the world. And so the story of the Bible is headed toward a new creation where the central blessing, and without which there is no blessing, is God himself. But it's a world of flourishing, a new Eden. So the question is, how do we get back to God and his flourishing world? And so as the movie, a story moves on from here, we see God unfold his promise. He promises that this Savior is going to come through Abraham and that Abraham will become a great people living in a great Eden-like land and there'll be great blessing and it'll spread to the nations. Genesis then, the rest of it shows how God keeps his promise and Abraham's line continues and develops into the people of Israel. And then in Exodus, Israel is enslaved in Egypt and so God delivers them from slavery, but he delivers them with a purpose. The book of Exodus is not just about deliverance from Egypt, it's deliverance into God's presence. And so the book of Exodus is about how God's people are delivered to dwell with him or for him to dwell with them. And so God brings them to himself at the center of the book to Mount Sinai. And when Moses goes to the top, heaven and earth are meeting again, just like Eden. God is speaking to Moses up there, and Moses then is viewed on Mount Sinai as a new Adam, humanity up a mountain again, like Eden, communing with God at the top of this mountain sanctuary. And we're getting a glimpse then of God restoring things. And on the top of this mountain, God gives Israel instructions to build a tabernacle. And the instructions and the building of this tabernacle are the last third of the book of Exodus. So much of Exodus is about the tabernacle. And so that's partly why some people leave their Bible reading plans in Leviticus because they're already a bit worn down from the last few chapters of Exodus, and then they realize there's more of this. But again, we need to see what's really going on here in part of the story. This is amazing realities because what God is doing here is He's giving them blueprints reflecting His heavenly dwelling. He's giving them blueprints in every detail for this tabernacle. And by the end of the book, this tabernacle is built, and then God fills it with His presence. And so the tabernacle will be how Israel takes God's Mount Sinai presence with them. So the tabernacle is like a portable Mount Sinai. And then the entirety of Leviticus is spoken while Israel is still there at the base of the mountain. They're still at Mount Sinai. They've been there for a year. And then God speaks. And then by the end of Leviticus, get to the book of Numbers, And it's a month later, and they're ready to go. And they take the tabernacle with them, and they journey through the wilderness onto the promised land. So God is speaking to Moses from the tabernacle in Leviticus at Mount Sinai. And the book of Leviticus contains God's instructions. Now that the tabernacle's built at the end of Exodus, here's his instructions for their life from here on out with the tabernacle in their midst. Now, later they'll settle in the land of Canaan and God will uh, take them to another mountain, Mount, Mount Zion, where Jerusalem, where his tabernacle will become more permanent as a temple. But we're not there yet in this story. So why is this so important? What is this all about? Well, the key is seeing that the tabernacle is a mini symbolic portable Eden. It's a model of Eden and creation. So here's several ways we see it. The tabernacle will, was built over the course of seven days. This was an intentional mimicking of the creation of the world in seven days. Even the, the things that God had them build over the course of those seven days, what happens on each day matches what's happening on the days of creation. The tabernacle had three zones of increasing holiness. So you have the first zone, which is this courtyard, and then the second zone is the holy place, so moving inward into the tabernacle tent, and then the most holy central zone is the holy of holies, or the most holy place. This mimics creation itself, where you have the wilderness all around, and then you have Eden, and then you have the garden in Eden, right? These zones... um, 
that the, the tabernacle is reflecting there. The linen used to make this tent is evocative of creation. It's made with beautiful blue and scarlet and purple, made to look like beautiful skies and sunsets. The furniture in the tabernacle evokes Eden. In the holy place, there was a lampstand on one side, this side if you're looking, you're walking in, and then a table on the other side. And the lampstand, we find out later, was shaped like a tree, pure gold, right, evoking the tree of life back in here in Eden. And then you have a table with 12, piece, 12 loaves of bread representing the 12 tribes of Israel. It's this picture of Israel invited into God's presence to feast in his presence again, just like Adam and Eve were to. Go, eat, enjoy, have a feast in my presence. And do you know which direction the entrance of the tabernacle was to face? Right? The, the way you enter is through the east, at the east, always east. Why? Well, that's where the entrance to Eden was, right? Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden to the east, and so they enter back in through the same way. And do you remember what was guarding the way back into Eden? Cherubim, these winged angelic guards. Well, do you know what is stitched onto the curtains that are the entryway into the holy place and the most holy place? Cherubim. Right, picturing the, the guardians that, that guard the way back to the tree of life and feasting in God's holy presence. And there was a sword, a flaming sword. And we know that you enter in there, as we'll see in Leviticus, casually and without offerings or sacrifices, and you're dead. But the priests will be using a sword of sorts to cut the sacrifices. So the sacrifices die in their place. So, some can enter, priests could enter, right? Israelites could enter the courtyard, but into the holy place, that second zone, only the priests, and into the most holy place, only the high priest once a year. Why them? Well, they're symbolically representing God's people. Israel is viewed as a new humanity, a new Adam, and the priests are symbolically representing them. They have the names of the tribes on stones, on their shoulders, and on their chest. They're carrying the people of Israel symbolically back into God's presence through these curtains with the guardian cherubim. So they're dramatizing in front of Israel. God is having them dramatize a re-entry back into His Edenic presence. So what's going on in Leviticus? We were made, you and I, were made to enjoy God's presence and reflect His character in communities of love. We were made to enjoy this Edenic wonder world, a world without hurricanes like the ones that, the one that we saw last week, a world without fires, deadly fires like we saw last week, a world without disease and disability, and death, a world without the sin that's in us and comes out of us and divides us. The story of the Bible is about how God is graciously bringing His people back. And so, He began to set up the categories for His people to understand this. The big story in Exodus and Leviticus is that God delivers His people to dwell with Him, that all foreshadows how He would do a great, ultimate, true deliverance through Jesus and our salvation from sin and death and be brought into His presence in a new world, a new Eden, but even better. So Leviticus is a little foretaste of this great deliverance and dwelling to come. It's a mini foretaste, but this is very limited and it's largely symbolic. So. Leviticus has tension in it. God is near, but He's distant. He welcomes them into feast, but it's just loaves of bread uneaten by the people. It's symbolic. He says, come on in, but you just have priests coming and representing God's people. He's creating categories for them. All of this is preparing for Jesus and the new creation that was coming that's already begun and is not yet fully 
here. It's showing us in temporary and symbol-laden form the life that God is restoring to us. So now we have the rest of the Bible, and we see where this is heading. Jesus came, and He brought all of this to its fulfillment. And the Bible ends with this vision of a new Edenic world to come. But when it arrives, it won't be many, temporary and symbolic. It'll be the real thing. And so Leviticus is not just, you know, a tedious collection of arbitrary and petty rules and rituals. It's enacting a drama that's part of a big story at the heart of history. So the key is seeing that the tabernacle is a symbolic Eden. Hope I've convinced you of that and that we hold that in mind all through this series. So now from here, I want to briefly show three central themes in Leviticus that flow from this. So the first theme is entering God's presence, right? drawing near to God. Leviticus is about how God's holy presence has entered into the midst of humanity. But God's presence is dangerous and deadly to sinners. And so he sets up this system so that sinners could survive his presence and be prepared for when they actually can dwell with confidence in his presence through Jesus. And the way is not just for people to survive his presence, but actually enjoy it, to taste the lost blessings of Eden and to long for Jesus and the new creation to come. That's what Leviticus was doing, ideally, for God's people. So here's how we see this. Uh, the big question raised in Leviticus is actually at the end of the Exodus. Leviticus is, is going to answer the question, solve a problem that's raised at the end of Exodus. So look back again um, at the last paragraph of Exodus. So right before Leviticus, last paragraph of Exodus 40, verses 34 to 38. The tabernacle is now finally built. God fills it with his glorious presence in verse 34. So it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Huge moment. But then look at verse 35. And Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So Moses had entered into the cloud of God's presence at the top of Sinai. But now that the tabernacle is built and that cloud fills the tabernacle, Moses can't go in. So God has planted this new, portable, symbolic Eden in the midst of our fallen world of death. But nobody can go in. Not even Moses. So here's the new Eden. But the children of Adam can't go in. They're still outside. The curtains are laden with images of cherubim guarding the way back. How will anyone enter to survive and enjoy God's presence? That's the deep question at this moment. And it's really the question that matters for every human being. How can a holy God dwell with sinful people? How can you, a sinner, be in God's presence? That's the question. You and I are going to die. We're going to stand before God. How are you going to survive? The gap starts to get removed in the first nine chapters of Leviticus. God gives this system of offerings and sacrifices. And through these ritual offerings, the way is being opened. So by chapter 9 in Leviticus, Aaron and his sons are set apart as priests, and they make their offerings. And by 9, verse 23, you can look at it, the problem at the end of Exodus is getting solved. So Leviticus 9, 23 says, And Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting. And when they came out, they blessed the people. Right Now that the offerings are made, they can go in. So they're dramatically portraying the re-entry of humanity into Eden, representing the people, carrying them on their chest. Here's God's people, humanity, Adam again, going to be with God. And by the end of Leviticus, we see that God is with his people and promises to be with his people as he was in Eden. 
if all goes well with them. So listen to the promise we read at the beginning in Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12. He says, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. One of the most repeated phrases in the Old Testament. And that phrase, walk among you, that's from life in the garden. It's from a word used in Genesis 3.8 when God would come to walk to and fro, walk around in the cool of the day in Eden. So God's once again walking with his people, walking around in the tabernacle with them in friendship. So that's the first theme, entering God's presence. Second theme is reflecting God's character. So Leviticus isn't just about rituals that happen in the tabernacle and being in God's presence. It's about a way of life. God is creating a way of life that's holy, which means set apart and devoted to God and reflects His character. So God has just rescued Israel by grace. So all of this is given not to kind of earn their way into His presence. It's given to people who are redeemed by grace. He's now their king. He's just called them at Sinai a kingdom of priests. So they're a kingdom, and they're to reflect his rule. And so God gives the laws not as a, mainly a burden, but also as a blessing. These laws are how they reflect his character. And that all goes back to Eden as well. In Eden, remember, God was the king. Humanity is royal. They're to reflect God's rule in the world. They're made in God's image. You were made in God's image to reflect God's character in the world. And then God rescued Israel, brings them back to this purpose. The laws that he gives, all of them in some way or other reflect something of his character for them. So the laws aren't arbitrary. It's not God just, you know, wanting to control and being petty and just making arbitrary things up for them. This is about a good God calling his people to reflect his good character in the world. It's from Leviticus that, we, that Jesus was quoting that famous statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's from Leviticus. And we'll see how all of these things point forward to him and are fulfilled in Jesus, but these laws that God gives, especially toward the end of Leviticus, these are about how God's people can live lives of love and justice and kindness. It's creating a community of moral beauty in the world. So it'll take some work sometimes to see this because they're ancient, given to ancient people in an ancient cultural context. But ultimately, ultimately, these laws reflect God's character. So they are situational, and they're in a particular covenant. And so everything in Leviticus is giving this kind of temporary vision of a, a life that points forward to Jesus where we live out the fullness of this. So we'll have to work to see how these laws are fulfilled in Jesus and how they relate to us. But they do relate to us, and we can learn from them how to reflect God's character. So those are the first two themes, enjoying God's presence, reflecting his character. That's what Leviticus is about. That's what Eden was about. The third theme is receiving God's sacrifice. So remember the key question for Leviticus. How can a sinful people dwell in the midst of a holy God? Or how can a holy God dwell in the midst of a sinful people? Adam and Eve and all of us are outside Eden in this realm of death. We're born apart from God's presence. We're devoted to things other than God. We value other things he's created more than we value and love him. It's idolatry, fundamental problem of the human race. We're all headed toward death. And the way back in is guarded. So how do we get in? Well, that's what the sacrificial system is about. There are a lot of sacrifices and offerings that fill out the picture, and we'll see that in these next coming weeks. But at the heart of it is the Day of Atonement. On this day, the priest offers several sacrifices. One of them is a goat sacrifice to cleanse the tabernacle because Israel's sin has polluted this dwelling place of God. Another goat is symbolically carrying away Israel's sins into the wilderness far away. Listen to Leviticus 16, verses 21 and 22. Describes the process. Aaron, the priest, shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel. 
and all their transgressions, all their sins. He shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who's in readiness. So the first goat is dying in the place of the people, so they don't have to. The second, and it's cleansing God's dwelling place. The second goat is carrying their sins away, picturing this removal of sins. So this is at the heart of how a holy God can dwell with a sinful people. It's through sacrifice. The word used throughout Leviticus is atonement. It's how God's people can be in His presence. So here's the point. The way back into Eden is through sacrifice, which is why the entryway into the tabernacle, you don't just waltz right in past the cherubim. There's an altar for sacrifice, for cleansing, for forgiveness, to open up the way. And this is at the very center of the book of Leviticus. Uh, The book of Leviticus was written in such a way that actually makes this very point, meaning the structure of the book itself. So the Day of Atonement is chapter 16. And that chapter is the very center of the structure of the book. So Hebrew literature often uses a chiasm as a structure. So a chiasm is a structure where the movement of thought builds toward a central point. And then as more points are made, they're kind of reversing the previous ones or going through the previous points in reverse order. So you can think of it like climbing steps up a mountain to a central point and then descending those steps in reverse order. Actually, you can see how Leviticus Leviticus is written as a chiasm in the graphic. So that Leviticus, you see the very middle, it says I-T-I. That's a chiasm. I didn't plan it that way, but I think it's kind of cool. So the T's at the middle, cross if you will, and two I's on our, are on both sides. So that's a chiasm, uh, building toward a central and then unwinding in the same way. And so actually the whole um, book of Leviticus is written in such a way that builds toward the Day of Atonement and then descends from it as well. So you have a section on sacrifices and meals, and then a section on the priesthood, and then laws distinguishing between clean and unclean then you have the Day of Atonement. And then from there, you have laws distinguishing between this time holy and unholy. And then laws about priests and priesthood. And then laws about sacrifices and meals again. And then a closing section. So it's climbing up to chapter 16 in the Day of Atonement and then descending. And actually, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the Torah, is structured as a chiasm. Leviticus is the central book, which means Leviticus is at the heart of of the first five books of the Bible, and at the heart of Leviticus is the Day of Atonement, the sacrifices that bring us to God. It's intentionally written this way. Plenty of scholars show this. I'm not just kind of making this, thing, this up. So do you see the point? The Day of Atonement, sacrifices, is at the heart of how we get back to Eden, how we get back to God. But it's temporary. It's a symbolic reality that pointed forward to Jesus And so the book of Hebrews in the New Testament recalls this, and it says the blood of bulls and goats can't actually cleanse and take away sins. Hebrews 10 says this. Verse 1 says this, For since the law, including Leviticus, has but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. So Leviticus is a shadow. What's, What's the substance casting the shadow? What's the true form? Jesus and everything he's brought. Since it's just a shadow, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year, make perfect those who draw near. Then it says this in Hebrews 10, 11, and every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down, his work was done at the right hand of God. And when Jesus died, an amazing thing happened. The temple is now built, right? This permanent tabernacle. And you have curtains and cherubim, and it's ripped from top to bottom. Right? God sending a sign, the reality's here now. You can come back in. And my presence is coming out. 
Jesus is the one who let the flaming sword fall upon him so that we don't just survive God's presence. As Hebrews said, and we started the service this morning, we draw near with confidence. That confidence is not purchased cheaply. Doesn't mean it's not confidence. It's not like, well, God's holy, so we, we always have to keep our distance. No, we come with confidence, but knowing we have no right to be there. But Jesus led us in through his death. Jesus fulfills everything we see. So Leviticus may be a strange world to us. God gave it to an ancient people in an ancient cultural context charged with symbolism that's strange to us. But if we carefully attend to this, we'll see that this book is shining with the glory of Jesus Christ. He came to be the true presence of God with us. He is the new tabernacle and temple. He is the true Adam who perfectly embodies the life of God's character of love. He came to be the true high priest who leads us into God's, the Father's presence. He came to offer himself as the true sacrifice for our sins, letting the flaming sword drop upon him so we could come in. And he now fills his people with his Holy Spirit, making us his temple right now. All who are united to Jesus by faith are filled with his presence as the tabernacle of God. And so now we're waiting for the new creation to come. And if you want to know what it's like, read the last chapters of the Bible and you'll hear echoes of Eden and echoes of the tabernacle and echoes of the temple. But the reality will have come. God will dwell with his holy people. And so he's inviting everybody right now to come to him, to draw near to him through the work of Jesus. If you've never done this, You can do this right now. You don't need to find a tabernacle. The Lord Jesus has been sacrificed for you. So you can, this very moment, just pray to God. Confess your sins to Him. Acknowledge that Jesus died as your sacrifice. He makes the way to the God who made you. Draw near to Him in your heart right now. Turn from your sin to Him. Receive His forgiveness. And then from here, get to know him. Get to know him in the Bible through prayer, living a life of love with his people. So as we engage with Leviticus, it's not about Leviticus. It's about Jesus, and it's about us. This is about God restoring the life we all long for, the life we lost in Eden, and doing it through Jesus. I hope you're excited. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your infinite wisdom and how you decided to plan history and redemption in this way. We recognize that saving us was no simple, small thing. And so we pray that you'd help us in our engagement with the book of Leviticus, would you help us see your glory in Jesus shine like a diamond, refracted, and seeing your beauty in him. We pray that we would be humbled before you, knowing that the only way we can survive your presence is through Jesus. We pray that you would cultivate an enjoyment of your presence, and we pray that you would help us reflect your character in the world. We pray this through Jesus. Amen.